much of the stream cover a story as complex and enduring as a 1947 partition of India? I'm Femi O.K. I'm Malika Bilal. Today we're hosting an on-air pitch meeting to get your ideas and we'll choose one of those to be a full show. So let's start with a little bit of history. On June the 3rd, 1947, the last British Viceroy of India, Lord Louis Mountbatten, held a live radio broadcast to announce a plan that would change the Indian subcontinent forever. Two new nations were created out of the British Raj, India, a secular country with a Hindu majority, and Pakistan, an Islamic republic with a Muslim majority. And that partition set off one of the biggest and most violent migrations in history. Hindu and Muslim neighbors turned on each other. More than 12 million people were displaced and some 2 million died. Take a look at this British newsreel from that time. As the new dominions of Pakistan and India take over their own affairs, communal hatred flares up in the Punjab. Fleeing from their looted, blood-stained towns comes a new exodus, a million displaced persons. Independence has not yet brought them peace. Rejoicing turned quickly into horror and mourning. Throughout this vast land, Hindus and Muslims seek safety in new surroundings. Peace-loving people, theirs is the real tragedy. The fortunate few flee in army transports or in buses. Fast forward 70 years and India and Pakistan have fought three major wars. The region of Kashmir remains contested and a frequent point of violence and a third country, Bangladesh, was created out of East Pakistan. In August, the stream will mark the 70th anniversary of the partition of India, and we would like your help to plan our coverage. We have a panel of people from the region here to discuss the legacy of partition and how they would like to see the stream cover those ideas. Well, if you like their stories or have your own partition show pitch, tweet us using hashtag partition at 70. So we have joining us Malika Aluwalia. She is CEO of the world's first partition museum, and she's in New Delhi. In Islamabad, Anam Zakaria is author of Footprints of Partition. In Srinagar, Shahnaz Bashir is the author of two books, The Half-Mother and Scattered Souls. In Dhaka, Zafar Sobhan is editor of the Dhaka Tribune. And in Cambridge, Massachusetts, Bina Sarwar is a Pakistani journalist and editor of Aman Ki Asha, a website dedicated to mutual peace between India and Pakistan. Hello, everybody. Welcome. So someone has to go first. Malika, I'm going to start with a, a very upbeat, positive story. And you're going to take us where? Set the scene. What's the pitch? So um, essentially, as you know, I'm working on setting up the Partition Museum. And it's a, we're setting it up as a people's museum to tell the stories of people who went through partition. Now, we're in touch with hundreds of partition survivors. And when we talk to them, what we realize is that a common, overwhelming narrative one hears is um, of inter-community violence, of in inter-religious strife. But there are so many stories that we are coming across of friend helping friend, neighbor helping neighbor, and even stranger helping stranger. And oftentimes, these uh, stretch across uh, community or religious divide. So the story I'd like to pitch is that uh, you know one of the shows should really look at highlighting some of those stories so that narrative of humanity and kindness um, mm -hmm. doesn't get lost when we talk about the partition. Uh, I'd like to propose that we bring on uh, people who themselves went through uh, the, these experiences. So, so bring on people from different communities and religions who themselves were saved uh, or were brought to safety by um, someone of an opposite community or religion. And, and hear their stories because there's real power in them. Mm. And uh, especially in today's world where we, there's so much polarization, I think uh, being reminded of that humanity and kindness uh, is important. And it's, a, it's an important narrative of partition uh, that, that shouldn't be forgotten. Malika, I'm getting the vibe very strongly. Sell one story to us. Pitch us one story. You say. For example, so many stories like this one. Tell me one that's going to grab our attention. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, uh, an experience I heard just two days ago is, is of this boy who was, you know, very young when partition happened, less than 10 years old. A mob had grabbed him. And in this case, it happened to be a Muslim mob. But you hear stories uh, of the same thing happening on the other side. And um, a neighbor came and basically told the mob, don't kill this boy. I will adopt him. I will convert him. He, and he just managed to dissuade the, the mob and send them away, and then later took the boy back to his family. Uh, you know, even in the, in the museum, we've got another story where uh, there was a, a woman who got 
a, separated from her family and uh, an elderly gentleman took her from camp to camp to camp for weeks till he could reunite her with her family. In this case, it was a complete stranger. I mean, he had no, um, you know, incentive to do that except for just um, the, the just mm -hmm. humanity and recognizing that, uh, you know, here was a human being in need and helping her. And we see that in every situation. Sure. Um, and I think these stories should not uh, be forgotten. So, Monica, I love that. And, of course, I know people love heartwarming stories because the news is full of the opposite. But I want to direct your attention to these two tweets we got. So we uh, conducted a Twitter chat before this show, and we asked, how did your family experience the 1947 partition, and how is it remembered? Mersey writes in, my grandmother tells me that it was a lot of bloodshed on both sides. He goes on to say that his grandmother says it was the most devastated time in her life. She was afraid of being kidnapped. So I'm going to direct this to Bina. Thinking of Malika's pitch, uh, does it do it just to only talk about the positives. Do you think enough people know about this bloodshed that Mercy here is tweeting about? I think enough people do know about that bloodshed that Mercy is tweeting about. I think that's the narrative that we hear most often is about the bloodshed and the violence. And in fact, Anam, I'm sure she'll talk about this. She grew up hearing about just how awful the other side was. And there's so many people who hear about just how awful the other side was, but you just don't hear about you know the good things that are happening or the, the the humanity that those same people who experienced the trauma how they experienced um, also good things and for example Salman Rashid he's a photographer and travel writer in Lahore and he talked about he, he, half his family was butchered uh, in in a small village in Punjab and he finally after many many tries he got a visa to go back there and he met one man who was actually the son of the man who had killed his own family, who wow. had killed Salman's family. And they connected, and they remained connected because they, he said that this was the only, only uh, link I have to that past of mine. And that, that man who was a boy at the time of part, or, or was probably not mm -hmm. even born at that time, that, that, or he was a young boy. But um, he and Salman connected even though that man's father had butchered Salman's family. Um, and... Then, I mean, I think that it's very important to focus on that humanity, especially now when all around the world we are seeing uh, the, the narrative of, of uh, hostility and bigotry and actually a fascist narrative uh -huh. taking, rising up right now. Which, which reminds me of partition of what happened at that time. Okay, Bina, so let me just check in to see what everybody else thinks about this idea. I want you to be really candid. Would you watch this on TV, Anna? Yes, I would. I couldn't agree more, actually. Um, you know, research has shown that 40% of partition stories are actually rescue stories. The thing is that India and Pakistan are so bent upon describing and uh, creating these state identities which are in opposition to the other, mm -hmm. that very complicated, nuanced experiences of partition, where you had intercommunal tensions but also intercommunal bonds, get packaged into these very simplistic, binary, linear versions. So school children, for instance, and that's been my focus, never hear of these rescue stories. For them, they don't uh -huh. even come across an Indian or Pakistani or a Hindu or Sikh in Pakistan. So they become these figments of the imagination. It uh -huh. is so important to start to humanize this dehumanized, yeah. de monstrous other. All right, we're going to move on. But gentlemen, just a thumbs up or a thumbs down for this story? Thumbs up or thumbs down? A yes or a no? Thumbs up. Thumbs up? Absolutely. Chinaz? Yeah, thumbs up. Yeah, I'm, uh, uh, oh, can right. I say something now? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, unfortunately, we uh, will continue to remain rutted in the human rights side of the problems of partition. We will continue to write books. We will continue to create more museums about it unless we address the fundamental questions like why it happened and what can be done to prevent it. For example, Kashmir has been replete with stories such as these you narrated uh, since uh, 1947 and more so from 1989 when the armed rising happened and when the militarization happened densely. Uh, and there was also uh, Jammu, where 200,000 Muslims were compelled to migrate into the Pakistani side of, um, you know, Kashmir Shanaz, uh, from I, Jammu. Shanaz, Shanaz, I, I understand this yes. per perfectly, but what we're looking at are ideas that we are going to put on Al Jazeera in August. That's what we're looking at, those particular stories. So I was really keen to see whether you like Malika's 
Malika's pitch so that we can actually add some more as well. What did you want to bring to the mix? What was your story for us? Yeah, I mean, uh, who uh, can uh, understand it better than Kashmiris uh, who have witnessed all this all these years and what happened in Kashmir, uh, what happened in Jammu and Kashmir in 1947 itself, uh, the fallout of the partition that 200,000 Muslims were compelled to migrate uh, from uh, the Jammu, from Jammu to uh, the Pakistani side of Kashmir, and uh, 300,000 were killed. And uh, so, in our discussion format, Shana, so so I'm, I'm focusing everybody in. What would be our discussion that you would suggest that we have in August? The discussion would be about yeah, my. my my question would be like it's not a question it's uh, it's like we always it's a question in affirmative like we yes. always say that why shouldn't we address those problems and why should we always be uh, unfortunately talking about um, a sad memory uh -huh. why shouldn't we address uh, important questions that would prevent the subcontinent from uh, more uh, you know, sad episodes like the partition. Okay, I That's hear. my open question to all, not only to India, not only to Pakistan sure. or Kashmir, but to the whole world. I mean, why should the world... For, for a second, if you say uh, that you disagree with what mm. I say or whatever who's, who, whoever says, but whenever this question is posed, uh, you see people getting angry, you know, mm. uh, at the first sight, you know, primarily there is no uh, reaction, but there is anger. I mean, why isn't why, the latest why, why? fallout, which may, yeah. which may not be directly con connected to the partition, All right, but Shinaz, is we, a fallout? We, we hear you. Well, well pitched. Malika. Um, well, I think people online agree with you. That's why we got several tweets uh, referencing Kashmir. This is Mohammed who says Kashmir is a live reminder of the violence of partition. So it should be at the center at, of this hashtag partition at 70. So we're keeping that in mind. I'm going to pivot just a little bit to, to share with you another pitch from a, a member of our community. This is Garga Chatterjee. Uh, he's a columnist in Calcutta. And here's his idea. Now, the last generation of the original refugees from East Bengal to West Bengal are now dying off and they are having this one last chance to look at, have a look at their homestead and there's a lot of tourism now which is happening, which is a lot of, uh, kind of niche tourism has developed which would take someone, make them visit their original homestead one last time before they die and I think Al Jazeera should make a story of what underlies these very complex journeys, albeit in the form of tourism. So Zafar, he mentions East Bengal, which of course is now Bangladesh. And really his, his idea is uh, partition tourism or going back to the place where your grandparents or your parents were born. I want to share with you this tweet. Umber says, I visited my family's historic home in Aligarh City. The current residents sent laddu or desserts for me to take back to Lahore. It was so cool. I got to experience the house where my dad and my daddy were born. I saw the view that they knew and I met people who remembered them. Shahnaz, what do you make of partition tourism? Do you think that that could be a good show, seeing people following their route as they discover their roots? Uh, yes, I'm, the latest episode to, uh, you know, what can, what, what, I just read a tweet uh, that you just, uh, you know, displayed uh, that the current, what is happening in Kashmir right now, it is also directly connected with the violence that happened in the partition. Oh, yeah. So the latest okay. is that uh, recently a tribal, uh, someone who lives in the peripheries of Jammu and Kashmir was lynched in Jammu for just having uh, sheep and cattle, you know, to rear. And uh, the f uh, families were compelled to migrate again to, you know, to farther uh, areas of the peripheries. So this is uh -huh. the latest happening in uh, Kashmir. So I think uh, we have to address this question, the, the basic fundamental questions that become reasons that uh, explode yes. into uh, violent yes. as, as you're talking about addressing questions, Zafar, Zafar looks like he has a question for you. Zafar, go ahead. Now, I just wanted to actually go back to the uh, point Garga made, and I think it ties in with the uh, discussion earlier. I think Bina, Anam, both of them had made the same point. I think we need to be focusing on our shared humanity here, 70 years after partition, because so many of the stories 
One hears the general narrative is one of doom, death, destruction, bloodshed. And Anna mentioned that 40% of the stories she has come across were rescue stories. I think that is not well known. And I think one of the ways of focusing on this is I like Garga's idea about uh, tourism, people going back in finding their roots across the border. I think another way of looking at this would actually be to locate families with members in two or even three countries. They mm. still exist. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I think that's a really fascinating angle. If you show families where, in fact, you know, uh, half of the family might be Bangladeshi, the other half Indian, or you have the yeah. same thing yep. between, let's say, India and Pakistan, sure. that would really hit home. That would yeah. really send the message, I think, of shared humanity, and, which everyone else has been so talking far, about it, in a very... Do you know what it, it tends to do as well? Mm -hmm. For people who are outside of India or Pakistan or Bangladesh or Kashmir, it connects them to that idea of being separated from family. Sure. Let yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think it's very relatable. Mm. You know, for people who are not from there, this is something which everyone can understand. And I think, you know, it ties in very well. You know, people going back and seeing their ancestral homeland, people going back and connecting with family across borders. And I think there are many stories like this. I know, for instance, mm. there are many uh, Bangladeshis who have family across the border in what would now be uh, West Bengal in India and vice versa. So I think that would be something which would be make fascinating television mm. and really humanize the stories we're trying to tell. Malik, you know what I'm hearing? I'm hearing very powerful stories. I feel like our, our guests and, and our pitches are pitching us powerful stories and then how we do it, it's up to us. Like we, it's our job to actually turn what they're sharing with us into a format that will work on the stream. I have to say also pitches, if you're doing pitching online or uh, via YouTube or via Twitter or actually uh, uh, our pitches here, we are going to turn one of these ideas, at least one of these ideas, into a show. And so our team is listening to your ideas, they're watching your ideas, and the one that they know, they know is going to be a show, they will tell us at the end of this first half of our open editorial. Malika. It, it, definitely, and I'm looking forward to that. Um, but I know that, Anam, you were nodding, you were raising your hand there <laughs> because you really wanted to get in. Go ahead, Anam. I just wanted to say that um, I've interviewed so many families like Zafra is mentioning over here, you know, where one sister is Indian or one is Pakistani, for instance. And what this really shows me is that partition is an ongoing process. It is not a static event that happened 70 years ago. It continues to impact families day in and day out. And what we also need to understand is that, or maybe question is that, you know, in a country like Pakistan, where you still have the first generation around, where you still have the partition generation around in all of these countries that we're talking about, how is it that the younger generation generations are so far removed from that holistic and very nuanced. I don't want to make it romantic. It's not rosy. They're, you know, they're full of violent stories as well. But they're holistic, right? Um, they're, they're shades of shades of gray. And how have we come to a place where it's so black and white? So I think that process also needs to be looked at. What are children learning today? Why are they learning it? How are they interpreting it? How have recent post-partition events like wars, religious fundamentalism, the Kashmir conflict, started to shape our understanding of partition? And what's going to happen when we lose that first generation and we don't have those stories documented anywhere? Because state textbooks and narratives are bent upon not mentioning these stories, right? So that, that's scary, and I think that's something that we need to really consider at the 70th anniversary because we're fortunate to have those people still around as walking, talking sources of that history. Bina? Yeah, I think I, was, that's, I really agree with all those points. And I think the other thing that I want to say is that uh, what Hannah said earlier in terms of looking ahead, I think that's really important also. I was in London um, last October, and we had a meeting where we talked about, um, it was just, I had gone for a conference, but at the end of that conference, we kind of had a separate meeting to talk about India, Pakistan particularly. And one of the things that came out in that was that we, you know, we 70 years have passed. I mean, this is, we're into the 70th year. What about 70 years ahead? Why We need to look forward at what's going, what are, are the next 70 years going to be like? Are we going to continue living like this? So, so Bina, this is, yes. this is, again, if, if you yeah. were watching this on Al Jazeera, how would you make that? How would you make I that? Think you How do you do that look do... ahead? So I think that what I would, what I, one thing that I, has come to my mind in recent years in terms of in the kind of work I've been doing is you look back to look forward. Mm. So you do have to look back. You can't just look either back or look either forward. I think that you need to look back 
to look forward. And you need to look at the entire picture, not just the, the very um, simplified black and white picture that our state narratives have provided us, but uh, and, and on both sides. Um, but we need to provide the full picture and then look ahead. How are we going to take that? Like I think what Malika is doing at the, the Partition Museum is, is a brilliant idea and it's something that we've been saying, many people have been saying for a long time, have a memorial. We need to memorialize uh, partition so we can move ahead because we've never memorialized it. We've never acknowledged it really. I mean, it's uh, it's acknowledged, half acknowledged. Like uh, our um, gov we uh, our people only learn like like Anam said, they only learn about the, the the bad side of the other side. So I think it's really important to look back and look forward. I like the looking back and looking forward. We got a pitch from Sandy Broyo, who really he's echoing what you said. But I'll have you take a listen to what he told us. And also a show that looked at young people today, born 40, 50 years after partition. What do they think of partition now? So, of course, that's picking up on what you mentioned, uh, Anam, which is why I, I happen to like your pitch. But I'm pivoting a little bit. This is Taha. This is another pitch. He says, what people don't realize is how involved China has been in the conflict post-partition. They have a claim on Kashmir. They have increased ties with Pakistan. There's a China-Pakistan economic corridor. So looking at China's role post-partition, 70 years post-partition, I'm wondering what you all think of that. Malika, what do you think of that pitch? I, I mean, I think, uh, you know, China's role in the world is uh, very interesting. Uh, and certainly in India, the, there, there is always a question of how it's aligned with uh, Pakistan. But I um, personally feel there has been a lot said about that already. So I don't, I'm not quite sure what would be the new angle that, you know, is being proposed uh, to be discussed mm, on that, because we, we do know Tahas that there is the pitch. corridor. Okay. <laughs> Bina, what, Bina, do you think that it's, it's been done? It's talked about? Everyone knows China's role? Um, I'm not so sure. I think that there's a lot of... Uh, I don't know how much people know. We know that China's involved, but I think it's not a bad idea, definitely, to bring it in and to explain what it means. And actually, I've heard a lot of Kashmiris say that they think that China's involvement now, they're looking forward to it as a possible uh, way to break out of the impasse, but I haven't really got my, uh, mm. my head around mm. the angle of how and why. Sure. Uh, so that might not be a bad thing to look at, for sure, yeah. Let me show you something here I've got mm. on my laptop. It's called the Partition Museum Project. It's one of the things that Malika is actually working on. Let me show you a little clip here from a lady called Indira. It kind of sums up what we've been doing so far on the stream today. I'm very happy that you are putting it together. I think it's high time that this, this whole um, enormous division of this country and all the fallout, it has to be documented and it has to be taught in our history to the younger generations who didn't live through that time because you can't just wipe it out and say it never happened. So on the week of August the 14th, we are committed on the stream to take a look at partition 70 years on, the partition of India 70 years on. So I think this has been a shared effort. We're actually looking at our control room right now. Have a look to see what the control room actually loved as the idea. They like Safa's idea. That's our senior producer, Maya Gar, saying it's Safa's idea of shared humanity. But I really think all of our well, my panelists kind of picked up on that mm -hmm. and our online pictures as well. Yeah, uh, we, we are not done yet. We have so many more stories to share with you. So stay online with us at stream.aldezira.com. You will see that story of shared humanity coming up on August on the stream. But right now we will continue online looking at Partition 70. What ideas would you like us to cover? Thanks for watching. See you online in a minute. Hello again, this is our Streams On Air pitch meeting and we are planning coverage for our 70th anniversary of the partition of India and Pakistan. Being a little bit cheeky because we're actually asking experts in their field to help us out. Uh, I, I want to go to um, Anam's idea here because Anam, you were talking about the idea of 
not everybody really knows about partition, that there are some people who are growing up who don't really understand it. But what about the rest of the world? How would you include them in a show that teaches about partition and why it's still important? I think what's, what's really struck me um, is when I wrote my book, a lot of people from different places I would have never expected in the world reached out to me and said, you know, we can relate. Because end of the day, like Zafra also said, um, these are stories of humanity, right? And so telling them through personal histories of people um, is, is the way to help the world understand as well, to help the world empathize um, and be compassionate about those stories. So for instance, a sister who's Indian and a sister is Pakistani, what happens when war breaks out? Right? What happens to your own identity? What happens to that distance to not being able to see each other? Similarly, um, you know, I think when you're working with school children, trying to understand um, the animosity that is breeding between them, oh my just goodness. go into a history classroom. That's the elephant That's in the room. We didn't actually even talk about that, the animosity that still exists. Yeah. 70 years on, people who weren't even born at the time. Can you, can you and it's put that into words for us? Can you tell <laughs> sure. us so, who are outside of India and Pakistan what that really means? Yeah, sure. So what I found in my research is that the further you move away, away from partition, the more hardline opinions are becoming. Um, and I'll give you two little anecdotes, one from Pakistan and one from India. Uh, so I had taken this uh, Pakistani student delegation with me to India, and the school, you know, the principal moved forward to put a tikka um, as well wishes and, um, and to greet us. And three of the children, who were, you know, about nine, ten years old, started to cry and asked them what happened, and they said, have we become Hindu too? Because we heard that Hindus have forcibly convert Muslims uh, to their religion, is that what's happening? So you have this kind of, this almost this fear and paranoia of the other. And uh, while I was in Mumbai, you know, I had a six-year-old uh, student run away from me when I said I'm from Pakistan, because he said, I'm scared of Ajmal Kassab, who was responsible for the 2008 Mumbai attacks. Yeah. So you have kids under the age of 10 having so much hostility, you know, they've already made up their mind where the Indian is the deceitful, mischievous one, because that's exactly the term that's used in textbooks, and the Muslim is the barbaric savage. Um, so that's how bad it is. And they're they not even willing to talk to each other a lot of times. Mm -hmm. So you have to break through so many stereotypes. We actually got a tweet with someone who is showing what that looked like for her. This is Sarah. She says, the biases we inherited, tales of the communal violence of partition were passed to generations and those perceptions were then shaped by those biases. So just like you were saying, these deeply entrenched thoughts about people on the other side. But Zephyr, I'm wondering if that's the same thing for you. Did you have biases growing up about Indians versus Pakistanis? And how did your role as a Bangladeshi, how did that fit into that role? I mean, it's very interesting. I mean, I think those tales certainly exist um, in Bangladesh because, of course, in 1947, Bangladesh was not immune uh, to these uh, forces being at that time uh, East Pakistan and before that time East Bengal. But switching up a little, I was wondering another if I could pitch another story. Of course. Is that, this is why you're here. Okay. Is that, uh, I mean, I think... The key stories of partition are really stories of dislocation, mm. stories of peoples being marginalized. And if you're talking about people who've been marginalized, what strikes me coming at it from a Bangladeshi perspective is to actually look at a community in Bangladesh who are variously known as stranded Pakistanis, Biharis. I mean, these are, in 1947, the non-Bengalis who migrated to what was then East Pakistan, and then after our war of independence in 1971, they essentially, I think uh, there were about a half a million of them, 150, 170,000 in time were repatriated back to Pakistan because these were people who identified with Pakistan, thought of themselves as Pakistanis, but the rest of them have remained in Bangladesh in, uh, in camps, in really, you know, fairly parlous circumstances in between, you know, they're not, uh, um, you have a, a 2008 Supreme Court ruling in Bangladesh which makes them full Bangladeshi citizens, but at the same time they still face striking discrimination, striking lack of opportunity, and total integration with the uh, Bangladesh is not really there. At the same time, I think Pakistan Supreme Court decisions say that they don't see any reason or need to take them back, although initially I think that was the idea. 
So, um, so far, I'm going to show some people. 71. I'm going sure. to I'm going to show our audience the uh, uh, a picture story, a picture essay from the Guardian newspaper. It's yeah. Stranded Pakistanis living in camps in Bangladesh in pictures. Sure. I'm going to scroll through some of these pictures. I'm just wondering, is this an underreported story, a story that everybody talks about but nobody cares about? How would you categorize it? I mean, it's interesting. It's hard for me to say. My suspicion would be that outside of Bangladesh, it is perhaps underreported. I'm not sure that too many people are aware of it. I mean, I think it is a great human tragedy, and it's an ongoing human tragedy, and I think really lays bare a lot of the contradictions, problems, dislocations of partition in a very human way. And I think this is a community which does deserve more airtime. This is a community which is, in many ways, been left behind by partition so here's in our, what has happened um, just, since then. Yeah, and, um, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I just want to come in over here because I was very recently doing research on this. And in Karachi, in Pakistan, you actually have Biharis who did move um, but still don't have the state ID card. So they're still even stateless here. They're, they're in a smaller number. But what you have in a larger number are actually Bengalis who are stateless. Sure. Um, so I visited them. And similarly, they're living in camps and in terrible conditions. So that is definitely an angle that perhaps we could look into at in the 70th year, are other people who are still stateless and have not found a home in either land. Malika, what did you want to say? What did you want to Brilliant. add? Go ahead. Uh, so even outside of Calcutta, uh, there, you know, I, I have read of a camp that's about 200 kilometers at Calcutta where there's this, a similar kind of population that even 60 years after partition has not managed to assimilate fully uh, into the Indian state. They don't have documents. And I think the reason this story will resonate with a lot of people is that actually uh, one of the things that's unusual about partition is, is that even though it was the largest migration in human history, uh, you, most of the refugees were welcomed, in a sense, by the state they were moving to, right? So what you would say is very different from the refugee situation today, where uh, states are like, no, no, we don't want more refugees. But there are these smaller groups uh, where that was not the case, where they continue to face that uh, displacement. And, you know, uh, I think Anam and Zafar have highlighted cases of that continuing till today. And so I think... Uh, this is an interesting story because it also fits in very well with what is happening in the world just now. Uh, and uh, that, that global sense of displacement uh, with, with the Syrian crisis. And, and so I think in, in the sense you were saying earlier, what is the connect with an international audience? I think a lot of them uh, would um, really, re you know, would be very moved by uh, uh, hearing of people who 70 years after an event are mm -hmm. still trying uh, to find uh, their home, having lost their original one. Bina. The only thing with that, I think, is that it's not 70 years. It's, this is actually a 1971 partition story. This is a, this is a story that is definitely needs to be covered, and I agree with Zafar, it's undercovered, and it's a huge tragedy that there are people who are, such a large number, are stateless, but they became stateless after 1971, not 1947. That is a, a very good point. We, we, it's a technical it, point. It, it, it's, it's about the, it's a, I suppose it's about the legacy of partition, but if being absolutely historically correct, that is a story yeah. that doesn't connect necessarily directly to 1947. 47. It connects to 1971. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It connects to 1971. Good point. But it is, it is part of that. But I think a, a, a story, a story from 1947 that still Though resonates. The Cooper's is, camp in West Bengal is 47. So the, oh, okay. Bina, finish your thought. Went... Yeah, fin finish oh. your thought. Yeah. Can I come in here? Let so, Bina finish her thought, and then we're going to go back well, to Malika. Well, I mean, if you, we, we can finish discussing that particular story, but I wanted to bring up another sort of a division, you know, like, and it kind of goes back to what Anam was saying about the divided families, the divided sisters. Um, I came across this story, and we used the map from that as a cover for Aman Kiyasha's Facebook page for some time. It was a story done in in the Herald, which is a monthly magazine in Pakistan, done by a young a Pakistani photojournalist and a young Indian journalist. And it's a story of a woman who hadn't seen her mother in 45 years. And she, her mother was on the Indian side of Kashmir, and this woman was on the, called Zeba. Her name was Zeba. 
and she was on the Pakistani side of Kashmir. And their villages are only 35 kilometers apart or something like that. But she had to travel 3,000 kilometers to go see her mother after she eventually got a visa, which, was, which took her 45 years to do that. And she went, by, by the time she got to her mother, having gone from, um, from, Kash, from Kashmir on the Pakistan side to Islamabad, to Lahore, to Delhi, to Srinagar, and to the um, other side, um, and her mother was blind by then and, you know, like on her deathbed, literally. Um, and that just like, it was so wrenching to see this. this and and these are, the, these are the, the poorest people, the most disenfranchised people um, who don't have resources. The people who have resources meet in third countries. They go to Dubai or they meet in the States or they meet in England or wherever. But people who are really poor, um, who have a hard time even going to a different city in their own country, for them to go to the other country, it's almost impossible. I think one of the biggest problems of that partition has left us with, like Anam said, it's an ongoing thing. But at the same time, you have, um, you know, the, the visa issue is, is, is so, it's becoming even more difficult now than it was before. So I think that's something that needs to be looked at, that, you know, why are, <laughs> why are these countries why is it so impossible for me as a Pakistani to get a visa for India and vice versa? Uh, and it's not just about divided families. Why can we not be like the EU? Why can, why, why can we not look at soft borders and trade? We, we're trading, and that's another actually part of it, is the trade that we are, we are losing billions of dollars by trading through third countries rather than direct trade across the sure. border. Sorry, that's so I, I, I like that you mentioned the trade on the border because I know that this is something that's come up often in our community, but I don't know how interesting it is for a TV show. So I want to get your idea on that. I want to pick your brain. This is Omran Chowdhury. He's a law student in Dhaka, and this is his pitch. I want AJ Stream to do a show on the effects of partition in the eastern part of the subcontinent. Partition um, resulted in 54 transboundary rivers divided between Bangladesh and India, and water sharing has been a problem. Partition also cut off transport and economic links, and reviving those old links can stimulate prosperity and remove mistrust. So Zafar, he talks about transport, he talks about water issues. We yeah. know these things are important, but would you watch a 30-minute show on them? Well, it wouldn't have I think there's a way to make that interesting. There is? Because yeah, I wouldn't watch that show. <laughs> you can do that when I'm on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, my, pitch. my pitch is this, is this actually uh, MJ Akbar, who was once a, a journalist and is now a very eminent politician in India, talks about the three partitions of the subcontinent. You got 1947, we all know about. 1971, there was a further partition with the birth of Bangladesh. But the real partition he talks about actually happened in 1965 with the Indo-Pakistan War, because up until then, the borders were open and people could go back and forth relatively easily. That's what changed everything. This is what Bina was talking about in terms of trade ties, in terms of getting a visa. And I think that's really what the new generation of Indians, Pakistanis, Bangladeshis are really interested in and would like to see is if there's any way we could go back to those pre-1965 mm -hmm. days. From 47 to 65, there was free movement between, um, uh, between the Indian subcontinent. And I think for a new generation, it would be really interesting to explore why that closed down and whether that could be opened sure. up and what would the be implications be for all of us. And I should say yeah, that just I, general infrastructure shows are very difficult to do. Shows about infrastructure and road and water, it's, it's very hard to make them engaging, but they're incredible and important. No, but, but, but look, water, I mean, look, there was a ferry between Bombay and Karachi. There was a mm. ferry that ran between Bombay and Karachi until the 19, until the sev until past 70, uh, until it stopped in, after the 65 war, but then was resumed again. And then the last ferry was somewhere in early 1984 or something like that. A ferry between Bombay and Karachi. There were road link, there was railway links between uh, the people of um, Rajasthan and uh, Sindh in Pakistan. These are historic links, like the Bangladeshi pitch said. And also, uh, you know, like rivers, they don't, rivers don't have borders. You know, the water doesn't have borders. We have fishermen every, every year. Every, every month, India and Pakistan are arresting each other's fishermen for crossing the maritime boundary without a visa. Please, for God's sake, this is so mm. ridiculous. They catch them, they put them in prison, they have no access to lawyers. They're there for years, their families don't know where they are. When they're eventually repatriated, somebody's like, oh, 
very kindly decides to repatriate them. They're not sent back via the, ro by, via the water route from Karachi to Bombay and on to their areas and vice versa. They sent all the way to, to Lahore, a thousand miles up, the, up, up, up north, and, and then by, ro by rail or across the border, and then again down south. That's, it's so mm -hmm. ridiculous. Let me just check in with Malika. How are people reacting and um, pitching? Are they liking what they hear? Are they saying, I can do better than that? <laughs> well, they're watching us live on YouTube and on our own site, and they are commenting. Most of them are pitching their own pitches, yes. but I think they're listening as well. Okay. Um, because here's one person who uh, listened to Anam, your pitch from a little bit earlier. This is Harun Khalid, who is a pretty prolific uh, writer on history in both India and Pakistan. Harun writes in, I am in... I am an educationist, and I think Anam's idea is fascinating. It's essential to look at how partition is taught in schools on both sides. Taking Zafar and Anam's idea forward, we could also look at how some of these same historical events are taught in these three countries, and what role does education play in fomenting this animosity. All nations go through this nation-making process. So, Anam, he really liked your idea. Do you see that as a full show? Because earlier, and if you take a look at my laptop here, um, this was a web piece we did back in 2015, and it got a lot of interest. It was partition, rewriting history, and we took a look back at textbooks in both India and in Pakistan to see how they taught about the other side. People love history. Yeah. Is there a way to do this into a show? I think so. I think if you go into a classroom um, and you kind of just film, um, you know, secondary school, government school, and a private school in all three countries, teaching partition, teaching 71, teaching about Kashmir, for instance, and just look at those disparities, follow it up uh, with interviews uh, with those teachers and students. And then what else you can do is juxtapose it with oral histories, right? So oral histories of those same events to kind of show that disconnect. And, and actually in Pakistan, um, a lot of civil society actors are now working on changing textbooks and, and creating um, dissent against this mainstream narrative. So you have this history project, um, and you could interview people behind that, that go in and teach uh, narratives from India and Pakistan, but in an interactive way and a holistic way and get the students to actually engage in that discourse. Another really interesting thing that you could add is, um, you know, after you film the students learning history, get them to Skype with each other, mm. get them to ask questions. Ooh. Get them to, you know, have like a live Skype interaction yeah. and just see what comes out of it. I love doing that with Indian students. And you move from a place where they think you're all murderers and terrorists to a place where they say, can we come visit you within one hour? And that is always so refreshing where you get to humanize um, the other. So I think um, history would be a great way to, because that's how, that, like Bina said, it's looking back to look forward, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we need to look at our history in order to figure out how to go uh, forward. I, I, can I say something? Of course. Yeah, I just want to, I just want to connect to uh, what Anam already said very nicely. Uh, I mean, being a writer, uh, I think Anam would also agree to the fact that uh, writers do understand more than anybody else the importance of documenting and recording the memories the horrific memories of whatever tragedies we have had. Uh, so in order uh, to, to, to educate the younger generation and to f make them feel uh, about what uh, kind of tragic past we have all had, uh, but always uh, for, uh, you know, uh, for, for understanding that how should it pave a path for future, like Bina rightly said that uh, we have to look forward but i would just add one uh, small point rather clause to the sentence that we have to look forward keeping intact and keeping in mind uh, the hindsight that we cannot look forward without asking difficult uncomfortable questions that we should agree with each other i have a little anecdote about you shared a lot of stories about it which is very important uh, from Kashmir side that there was this guy who came from the Pakistan side of Kashmir to meet his aunt mm -hmm. to Kashmir uh, in uh, Indian side of Kashmir some 20 years ago and he was detained here under Public Safety Act for 17 years and nobody knew what happened to him and it was later when people started going to jails and documenting uh, what was happening to the detainees we came to know about uh, the person and the person spent 27 years of his life in a Kashmiri Whoa. jail. So this is a story that is, you know, that traces its 
uh, path to the partition. So uh, again, uh, I mean, uh, people may like it or not, and it may sound incongruous, but it's as natural as anything like after all the history, the sad history, the narration, mm. uh, what happened in the past, we cannot do away with asking difficult questions that mm. what can be done to prevent such bad episodes happen in future. So we have to consider uh, problems that uh, are brushed under the carpet, she but are very it, important to resolve ask, with let sincerity me ask you about this because so that we can move ahead. We can, we can what, move what I'm really curious about is Kashmir is such a difficult issue to discuss, to even get people to come on TV to talk about it. Who would you have on a show where you're saying, let's address the difficult questions in your on your dream guest yes. list? Who would be on that show? Yes. Yes. See, uh, the what whatever has happened, whatever has happened from 1947 uh, till date, uh, it is the uh, you know from from Indian side. I would like to have the representatives of Indian government from both ruling as well as opposition, because both of them are responsible for anything that has happened and for the future you know course of action also. So it could not be a person A, B, or C. It mm. could be any representative from the government who who has to be answerable. I mean, how how long can we stretch? Why should be why should we unfortunately be talking all the times about what has happened to us? Why shouldn't we also have a future in which we would run? Right, that how we resolve it, mm. how writers, artists, and politicians as well, who have also a moral responsibility to come forward. We as artists and writers, you know, frequently forget that there ha that politician has to be kept aside because we, we do not have, have a moral uh, side to solving disputes. Okay. But it is the politician who has to come forward. It is the person who is administering a certain powerful government that has a duty to be sincere and resolve issues which lead to bad and sad mm. episodes like okay. partition. All right, Shanaz and Bina, Zafar, Anam and Malika, thank you so much for lending your expertise, your excellent pitches and your storytelling to help us design a whole week of programming looking at petition 70 years on. Malika? I'll end with a couple of rapid fire pitches via YouTube and those watching live there. We got a pitch to cover the Christians in Pakistan. Uh, the, the next pitch is from Sun on Twitter. She says she wants us to look at the uh, Balochistan conflict in Pakistan, something the stream has covered several times, but it, it might be time to take another look. And this last one is just something to keep in mind from Nida. Let's talk about partition not as a singular event, but as a slowly unfolding and painful process. Thank you, guests, for being part of our open editorial. We really appreciate it. To tune back in, obviously, every week that we're on, but particularly the week of August the 14th, and you can see the fruits of your endeavours then. Thanks for watching. Take care, everybody.